Writing Out Loud. A program designed to explore in-depth interviews with writers to hear that words have voices. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. My very special guest today is Oscar winning filmmaker, Gray Fredrickson. Thank you so much for being here, Gray. My pleasure, thank you for having me. When you were a kid selling movie tickets in Oklahoma City, <laughs> did you ever think that one day people would be standing in line to see your films? Never, never. I never dreamed I'd be in the movie business. You did. I liked the movie. No, I, we didn't have film schools when I was growing up. There was no, I didn't know anybody that said, I want to go be a cameraman or a sound <laughs> technician. Or, there were a few people that said, I'm going to go to Hollywood and be a movie star. Mm -hmm. But no one ever thought of being in the movie business in mm -hmm. Oklahoma City. It was so far removed from it. And I never dreamed that. But I did like movies and I liked working at the movie theater. <laughs> and uh, uh, was fascinated with it. And I remember the first movie star I met, I was in, was uh, uh, it was uh, Gregory Peck. And oh, I was, a big one. Uh, yeah, I was walking uh, in Lausanne, Switzerland. I was going to school in Switzerland mm -hmm. for uh, one semester. And I saw this American standing on a street corner with a map looking around. <laughs> he was lost. I said, God, that guy looks familiar. And I went over and I said, oh, can I help you? He said, yeah, I'm looking for the cathedral. I said, oh, it's right up there on the hill, right there. Yeah. I said, you look so familiar. Where do I know you from? He said, Greg Peck, nice to meet you. <laughs> I thought, wow, I met my first movie star. It was quite a thing. Did living in Europe give you a better handle on what you wanted to do with your life? Uh, no, I just, it, it uh, living in Europe gave me the opportunity to get into the movie mm -hmm. business. Important but, distinction. Yeah, I, when I first went to Europe, I had no idea what I was going to do. I was just uh, ski bumming around and trying to find it. I got a job working for an engineering company in Rome. Mm -hmm. I spoke a little French and a little German, but no Italian. So after about six months in Rome, I acclimated and learned the language. And uh, and uh, Americans all hung out together. Mm -hmm. They still do. Wherever mm -hmm. you go, you know, you go to bars where the Americans all go. And it happened to be all the Americans hanging out in Rome were film people because it was mm -hmm. runaway productions. Like <laughs> today, everybody goes to Canada, mm -hmm. or they have been going to Canada. Now they're going to New Mexico and Louisiana and places that give great incentives, which we tried to do here in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. worked, sort of. And uh, But back then, they went to Italy. Uh, some of them are going to Eastern Europe now, Romania and, uh, and uh, uh, some of the Eastern country, European countries. Rome was the hot spot and so I met all these filmmakers in Rome and uh, they uh, said, why don't you uh, produce a movie for us? They thought I was rich. <laughs> they thought I was this rich Oklahoma oil guy because I was making uh, uh, half of my salary, half of my salary every month uh -huh. was payments on a Maserati oh. I had bought. <laughs> so I was driving around Rome, I was, what, 21 years uh -huh. old, 22, driving around this Maserati, and they thought I was rich, and they said, why don't you produce a movie? I thought, well, that's cool. How do you produce yeah. a movie? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. And they said, get the money. And I guess it's the same today. If you got the money, you can produce a movie. <laughs> so I came back to Oklahoma, went to all my friends that I'd grown up with, and my family, and mm -hmm. my family's friends. And I raised enough money to make a little movie in Italy. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know how to make a movie. <laughs> With John Barrymore Jr., who mm. later became the father of Drew Barrymore. Yes. And we made this little movie. And uh, then I said, what do you do with it? No one's buying this mm -hmm. movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they said, well, you got to go sell it. Mm -hmm. I thought that MGM was going to knock on my door and say, here's... <laughs> Here's here's a million dollars for yeah. your movie, so uh, they said take it to the to the market to the film market. Right. And the biggest film market at the time was the Cannes Film Festival, so I took it to smuggle the film across the border into France and took it to Cannes and uh, showed it to, at the festival and made a couple of sales and that kind of what got me into making movies. The Italians and I'd met Italians during the making of it. Italian producers. Mm -hmm. And they were impressed with how we made it so cheaply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they, they brought me in to produce movies with their little Italian companies. 
So the Maserati was a really good investment. It was a great investment. <laughs> Gave me the leverage. You know, you got to have leverage to yeah. get something done. They, they, they thought I was rich. And I spoke, it, uh, and I spoke languages. I spoke French mm -hmm. and Italian and mm -hmm. English. And that was, uh, it gave me a little leverage. It helped me as a producer working with international crews and things. Oh, abs Europe. absolutely. One of your first major films was The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly with Clint Eastwood. It's been called one of the great westerns of all time. What makes it a classic? Oh, it's just, it's, it's just it's Sergio Leone at his best. Mm -hmm. You know, he did those spaghetti westerns, Fistful of Dollars, mm -hmm. and a few dollars more. But this was his big movie. And, uh, Pretty expensive movie for the, for its time, and um, it had humor and uh, great, wonderful characters. Uh, Eli Wallach was mm. just great in it, and uh, and Clint, and uh, you know I I worked on. We were going to bring the reason they hired me was I became the go-to person mm -hmm. to take Italian movies to America to shoot in mm -hmm. America. They, they realized that, it, that Italian movies, they'd have two movies in the theater, one uh, Italian movie and one American movie. People lining up for the American movies, but nobody going to see the Italian mm -hmm. movies. Mm -hmm. So the Italians figured out, well, we'll make movies that say they're American. Mm -hmm. So they changed their names. They had, remember yeah. Terrence Hill and Bud Spencer, those were yeah. Italian actors, but they just, they dub them in English and they'd say they were <laughs> Americans. And they would go shoot for a week or two or a month in uh, Los Angeles or the Grand Canyon or Miami Beach or New York City, and then go back and finish the movie in Italy and say it was an American movie. And I became the guy to do those American mm. movies. And they hired me to do to take the good, the bad, and the ugly out to Monument Valley, John Ford country, mm -hmm, where they shot mm -hmm. all the wonderful westerns. And they had this big scene with a bridge that they have to blow up mm -hmm. a bridge and every time they blow it up, it just poof, and the railing would fall off, and it wouldn't blow up. So finally, they brought in special effects people from uh, Italy, and by this time, everybody was blasé. We were sitting there, said, "Watch out for the explosion!" Yeah, yeah, right, the explosion. Well, they blew that bridge up. It, I mean, there was nothing left, just dust, and not one camera was rolling when they <laughs> blew it up. They had oh. what they did was they put a camera. They called it a tied off camera. Mm -hmm. And they would put it on a little tripod down next to the explosion. And then they would start it running at high speed. And then the cameraman would run away and leave it there. And when the explosion would happen, it'd blow the camera out into the field. But they would go and retrieve the film. And then they'd have a good close up of the. So they told the cameraman, go, <laughs> run down, start that. And the special effects guy heard, but go. And he. <laughs> and not one camera, five cameras, not one camera was rolling. So they canceled going to America because they had to stay yeah. there and oh, rebuild yeah. this bridge was like several hundred, probably half a million dollar bridge, big bridge, oh. built by wood and wood to period. So they canceled our, our trip to, to uh, Monument Valley, but during all that time I was there on the movie, I became friends with Clint Eastwood. Yes. We were, Americans so sure. without, without wives there. And uh, Clint's the one that sort of taught me into coming back to Hollywood and I uh, started working with him and that's sort of what got me into the business. And then just a few years later you began your longtime association with Francis Ford Coppola. Yeah, The Godfather. We, uh, through Clint I met a guy named Al Ruddy. Mm -hmm. And Al Ruddy, uh, I, I met him and he had just sold Hogan's Heroes, mm -hmm. the TV series. And uh, I said, well, uh, this guy's my hero. You can sell a television series about uh, prisoners in a <laughs> Nazi prison camp to the, the Jewish Hollywood establishment. That's pretty, that's a hell of a salesman. And, uh, and he, he uh, was trying to do a picture with uh, Clint. And Clint brought me along to the meeting and I met Al and we became friends and he had a picture he said come do this picture with me at uh, Paramount I have a deal at Paramount Pictures to do a movie about motorcycle racing with Robert Redford called Little Foss and Big yeah. Halsey yeah. no one knew who Robert Redford was hmm. and Clint told me uh, he said you know I think I'm going to be a big star he was sitting in my living room I just moved into my house in, in uh, Beverly Hills 
said, I want you to come and produce all my movies and uh, be the president of my company. And, and I'm thinking, this guy's never going to be a big star. He's <laughs> got a weird voice. He's never going to yeah. make it. And I told him, I said, Al Ruddy, he's, he's got this picture at Paramount. I can make $1,000 a week at that. What can you pay me? He said, well, I can't pay you anything now. I mean, right <laughs> now, but when I get going, you'll make sure. good money. I said, I'm going to go with 1000 a week. So I, and uh, we're still friends. I'm still, I'm, I, can, yeah. I can get him on the phone. It doesn't, he doesn't answer immediately. Maybe he'll call me back. But it was never the same after I turned him down. Mm -hmm. but he, he's still friends and he's still a good guy. And uh, on Million Dollar Baby, I was on the set quite a bit because uh, Al Ruddy, my sure. partner that I got started with, uh, produced that also. So, When you were working on The Godfather, did you have a sense that it was going to be such a huge hit? No. Really not? No, as a matter of fact, they hated it. The studio hated it. We thought we were going to be fired every day. Uh, the first day, from the very beginning, there were problems. They wanted to make it modern day and uh, not have uh, spent any money on it. And Francis wanted to make it, period, wanted to do the book. Mm -hmm. They wanted just to, you know, capitalize on the title because the book was a bestseller. But they made a movie called uh, The Brotherhood with uh, Kirk Douglas mm -hmm. about organized crime and mafia. And it died, and they said, "Oh boy, we've got this book, and and people don't want to see a mafia movie." Mm -hmm. So they they were already hesitant about it when we started making it, and then we had the big fight. Francis had to fight with them over Marlon Brando because mm -hmm. he was like death at the box office. Mm -hmm. They were afraid he was going to misbehave, and that people didn't like him. And the first day we were filming, uh, we were filming. Well, Gordon Willis, the cameraman. Mm -hmm had this whole thing about light. He shot everything sort of very dark and uh, had that gold, dark look. That was when, you know, Doris Day, Rock Hudson, mm -hmm. with big, colorful, brightly lit movies. This was a very moody, dark, somber thing that big Hollywood didn't do. So they were concerned about that look. Gordon was, his lighting was so specific that he had a, on the front of his camera, it said, Actors think marks are German movie, hmm. German money. And uh, if an actor was sitting in the camera, if the actor moved like this, he went out of the light and he was in the dark. So they were having all these problems with Gordon's lighting. And, and, and the first day, Marlon Brando found a cat on the south stage. And he had the cat and he was carrying it around with him. He said, <laughs> I'll just have this cat with me. And he had a mic, a radio mic right here. Right. And he had the cat. And he had appliances in his mouth when he was talking like this. He was in and out of the light half of the time because it was so dark. They had $10,000 on a big desk that the art department bought. You couldn't see it. So the studio, the first day they see the dailies, they have Marlon Brando is out of the dark. They can't see the set dressing that cost $10,000. He's talking like this, and the cat's right here purring against the mic. <laughs> so they can't hear him. They can't see him. Can't. So, so from there on, it was downhill. We thought we were going to be fired every day and uh, until the movie came out. Matter of fact, I, uh, someone came to me and offered me $25,000 for my interest in the movie for my back end mm -hmm. participation. And I was going to take it. I needed the money. And uh, everybody said, don't sell it. That movie could make money. Wow. Gosh. Understatement. Oh, boy. <laughs> were, were you hesitant at all to do Godfather 2? A lot of people are, you know, skeptical of sequels. No, no. We, I was excited about doing Godfather 2. And... Uh, what because they were Paramount wanted to call it Godfather Returns or the Son of the Godfather. Oh, oh. Uh, because they said there's never been a movie called Part Two. That it doesn't mm -hmm. exist. That mm -hmm. doesn't work. It, people will think they it's part of the first movie. We said, well, and it is. And so they it absolutely they were putting out all the notices and press releases that it was Son of the Godfather or the Godfather mm -hmm. Return. And Francis says, well, we got to stop this. So he had me 
print up all kinds of stationery and calling cards with Godfather Part Two on it. And, uh, and it just sort of took hold and just by will became the title. What was it like Oscar night? Well, Oscar, <clears throat> we were, Francis had another picture called The Conversation. Mm -hmm. So we had two pictures fighting each other. Mm -hmm. Paramount, who was our studio producing, had a movie called Chinatown, mm -hmm. Roman Polanski, mm -hmm. that the head of the studio had produced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the studio was behind Chinatown. Uh, Lenny was a big movie with uh, Dustin Hoffman. Yeah. It was a big hit movie. And then there was a Towering Inferno, <laughs> which was produced by two studios, 20th Century Fox and MGM. Studios, whatever they, they're, all the people that work for these studios vote for the movies of mm -hmm. the studios. Mm -hmm. cool. So we, had our, we were competing against ourselves. Paramount was pushing for their other movie, Chinatown. Towering Inferno was two studios, all their people. So there was no way that Godfather Part Two could win anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It wasn't even considered, it wasn't even in the running. And we were, th I was just thrilled to be there. Mm, no, I bet. I was just, it was great. I'm kind of at the Oscars. I was there and they, they, they and I'm sitting on the front row and I'm, I'm, I'm that was all I wanted. That, I was just thrilled. And all of a sudden, Godfather Part Two started getting best third, uh, actor and best music score. And I looked over to my partner, Fred Roos, and I said, what if we win? This, this, thing, this thing could win. He said, no, not a chance. I said, what do we do if it does? He said, I don't know. I said, all right, well, you thank the cast, and I'll thank the crew. And it won, and that's what we did. It was a shock. I mean, it was a total shock. Where do you keep your Oscar? On my desk in my den. <laughs> You've said that one of the most challenging films you ever worked on was Apocalypse Now. What went wrong? What went right? Nothing went right. <laughs> <laughs> Everything went wrong. Uh, it was uh, the very beginning. We had the wrong actor, uh, Harvey Keitel, playing mm -hmm. the lead, and he was kind of a New York uh, street guy. Right. And uh, he didn't fit. He didn't like it. Uh, he was happy when he was replaced. Uh, we were in the Philippines, which mm. was, was very difficult conditions. Uh, we tried to stay in Manila in, in sort of decent uh, accommodations, but the traffic was so horrendous that you have to get up at five in the morning to mm. go for a three hour drive to go like 10 miles. Mm -hmm. Uh, you just can't move in that city. It's just jam packed. It just the traffic was for. So we moved out into the jungle and uh, no hot water. And uh, it was just, it was it, it, very unpleasant. Uh, the food was uh, bad. And uh, uh, people were getting dysentery and food poisoning. Guy came on the set one day, one of the Filipino guys holding on a stick, a snake hanging on the stick. Mm -hmm. He said, This is a coral snake. If you ever see one of these, make sure you don't step on it or get away from it, because if it bites you, you die in two seconds. <laughs> that was, he found it on our set. I, well, that, that was the kind of stuff. We had a typhoon that wiped out everything. Um, we, we just had nothing but problems. Later on, Marty Sheen, the oh, actor, yes. had a heart attack. Uh, I had two birthdays in the Philippines. Oh. I was over there that long. We, I came back twice. Uh, one time at Christmas and one time when we had the typhoon. But uh, it was a long, rough time. And uh, we had, uh, we got to go to Hong Kong about every once a month or maybe once every three weeks. And I'd go to Hong Kong and we could go into the Peninsula Hotel and wonderful sheets and hot bath and great food and it was heaven. <laughs> the day you had to get on the plane to go back to the Philippines, back to the jungle. It was like, the, so we had a lot of uh, Vietnam vets working mm -hmm. on the movie. They said, this is just like being in Vietnam, except they're not firing real bullets at us, but everything <laughs> else the same. And I would always buy a box of C's candy. Mm -hmm. 
wonderful seized chocolate that were from sure. L.A. They reminded me of home. And I would keep them hoarded away because, you know, I didn't know when I was going to get back to Hong Kong to get another box. And on Wednesday nights, they had a TV series called Rich Man, Poor Man. I remember it. And so that was my night to lie back on the bed and get my box of C's candy and watch Rich Man, Poor Man. Everybody knew, leave me alone that night. <laughs> and Marlon Brando had showed up. He was there, and he was in the little cottage next door to us. Did he have a cat with him? <laughs> no cat, but he, he, carried, he had an extra 300 pounds on top oh, of Oh, well, that's pretty So he was huge by this time. Yeah. And I came home to watch my movie, my series. And he was at the foot of the bed with my girlfriend, and they were playing backgammon. And he was eating my seized candy. And I was on the bed trying to watch the show, and they're laughing and carrying on. I can't hear it, and he's talking. And every once in a while, I'd see him reach over and get another piece of my seized candy. I'm sitting here saying, I am such a wuss. Why don't I have the, <laughs> to say, to get the hell out of my place and let me eat, quit eating my candy. But it's Marlon Brando. How are you going to tell Marlon Brando? So I just sat there and, uh, and uh, took it. But it was. What are your fondest memories of working on The Outsiders here in Oklahoma? Well, being back in Oklahoma was wonderful. And uh, I guess. Those kids were great. Mm. And, uh, you know, they were all, it was one big party. F for the first month, I was on the same floor in the Hotel Doubletree. Mm -hmm. And you'd come home at night, and the floor, the whole hallway was lined up with girls sitting <laughs> on the floor with the autograph books waiting to see them. And the guys were running up and down the hall squirting fire extinguishers through keyholes. And it was kind of crazy and fun mm -hmm. and wild. I finally moved out and got a little uh, rented apartment because you couldn't sleep. Mm -hmm. it was, they were mm -hmm. partying all night, except one person who was never there. He moved away from that floor. And he was always off by himself, uh, reading, studying, working out, out jogging, never partying with any of the kids. Who do you think that was? Well, I don't think it was Matt Dillon. <laughs> Tom Cruise? Yeah. Really? He was a serious one. Did you have any idea these guys were going to go on to be great actors? I had a big feeling. I thought Matt Dillon would become a huge star. And he's still, I mean, he's done very well. Not quite as, I mean, Tom Cruise eclipsed them all. Look at, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I, I didn't think, I didn't. All I, I remember noticing Tom Cruise, I said, he's so disciplined and he works so hard and he's so serious about his craft that he's going to be successful. Mm -hmm. I never dreamed he'd be such a huge star. What brought you back to Oklahoma to stay? You could live anywhere, Gray. Why, why Oklahoma? Well, it was a combination of things. Um, I got married late in life. I had two young children. Uh, my Hollywood party days had ended because mm -hmm. I had this family now, mm -hmm. so I wasn't going up to the Playboy Mansion mm -hmm. anymore. I was at home watching uh, SpongeBob and, uh, and uh, the dinosaur. What was that dinosaur yeah. thing? Barney. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking, I can do that anywhere. And about that time, uh, Ed Cook, who was a head of tourism in Oklahoma, called me and said, we, we had a movie here called Twister that made a lot of money for the state. We like these big movies coming in. And we want to change our film commission and wonder if you'd come back and, and run the film commission. I said, well, I, I, I can't do the film commission. But... Uh, they came out, Barry Fallon was lieutenant governor, they came out and I gave them tours of the studio and helped them meet mm -hmm. people to promote business here. And they kept saying, come back and help us get it going. I said, well, I, 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 I don't think I can afford to come back here uh, to, to move and all that. I'd have to have something to do. And uh, Ackerman McQueen, the advertising agency, mm -hmm. contacted me and said, we want to promote movie business, we'll pay you to come back. So all of a sudden, they're offering me money to move back here. And uh, Frank Keating and 
Eric Fallon, and uh, they're all saying, come, come to Oklahoma. And we just have a little over a minute here, and I want to ask you, you're currently artist in residence at Oklahoma City Community College. What's the most important lesson you want to pass along to your students? Uh, don't give up, because if I can do it, <laughs> I knew nothing when I went off to make a movie. Absolutely not. I didn't know how to make movies. Now they have all these tools that they can shoot movies with their cell phones. Uh, they have all this wonderful high definition equipment. We have a great program at the college mm -hmm. teaching them how to be filmmakers and I mean, everything from wardrobe and, and props and set dressing and camera and sound. Uh, and, and they're going out and making their movies. Mm -hmm. So just go out and do it. Make your movie. and. Uh, You'll find success if you hang in there and don't give up. Mm -hmm. Any regrets as you look back over your film career? Is it true you passed on E.T.? I did. I passed on E.T. I passed Clint Eastwood. Uh, yeah, I've, I've made some regrets as far as that. Uh, my biggest regret is that I didn't, uh, I wasn't more frugal and saved my money uh, when I was young and partying and not had no family because I didn't think I'd ever, you know, but uh, I had a good time. Oh, and so of all the people who've gone to see your films, thank you so much for being here, Gray, and sharing your stories with us. And thank all of you for joining us on Writing Out Loud.